Hello and welcome. Um, so I finished out my 2016, um, you know, first time reads for this year because I decided that in December what I was going to do is have December be a month of rereads. Um, you know, reading stuff that I've read in the past because I feel like, um, you know, sometimes uh, I get so caught up in reading reading the next new thing that um, I don't go back enough and, um, you know, revisit things I read earlier um, because I find that, you know, when, when I have done that and reread something, I get, you know, something different from it each time. So I decided since December and January is sort of the end of the year, at least in the culture I'm from, um, the year's about to change. Um, that December is a good time, you know, for looking back, and then January is the month for looking forward. So December is kind of reflective. December is sort of a reflective month for me. So anyway, um, the first um, book that I have re finished uh, rereading in the month of December is The Dispossessed by Ursula K. Le Guin. So um, this uh, I originally, it looks like the last time I read this, according to Goodreads, was back, I think, in 2012. So it's been a few years, and that's the first time I read it was back in 2012. So this, I just completed my second time reading um, this um, this science fiction novel, and, um, you know, I'm really glad I did, because as it turns out, I actually had forgotten um, a lot of the details of it, and so it was really, it's really been a great experience to, to, um, to, you know, revisit this work again. So, you know, like I said, it was published in 1974. It, um, is classified, I think, as utopian science fiction, um, I'll talk a bit about, a bit, a bit about that more, uh, more in a bit, um, but, it was, uh, you know, it was it was well received at the time, 1974. It won the Nebula Award that year, and I think the following year in 1975, it won the Hugo Award. So, um, it is part of a series called the Hainish Cycle, H A I N I S H. I think is how you spell it. Cycle and. Um, so I have not read any of the other, um, there's like seven or eight uh, works that are included in this Hainish series or Hainish cycle. And um, I think this is like the fifth one or so um, in, that, in that cycle. But um, the Hainish cycle is, um, is all pertaining to, in this, it all takes place in this same universe um, that The Dispossessed takes place in. So what this is about is really it's utopian, um, you know, so it's what it's showing us is a couple of different forms that societies have taken. One of them is very recognizable to us, um, and then the other one is not quite so much. So the main character's name is Shevek, and he uh, actually lives on a planet called Anaris, and this is in the Tau Ceti system, which is near to Earth. You know, it's like something like 10 or 11 light years from here. Um, but um, there's there's twin planets in this system. One is called Anaris, which is where Shevek lives, and then the other one, the other planet is called Erasti. And so the to the to the to people on Anaris, Erasti is their moon, and to the people on Erasti, then um, Anaris is their moon. So um, what has happened though in the history? Um, everybody uh, in on both these planets originated on Erasti, and a, about 150 years ago. Um, or so, there was a revolution on Arasti um, um, led by a woman um, named Odo, um, and she, um, you know, she advocated for anarchy, a form of anarchy, as the best form of social arrangement. And so, um, to make peace with this sort of revolutionary contingent, the um, the world governments, United World Governments of Urasti, um, decided to give um, these people the option to move to Anaris the moon, which at that point was uninhabited, and so they did, um, and so it took quite a while, I think about a million of them moved and set up a society on uh, Anaris, and the two the, the two planets have, have not had hardly any contact since then, it's forbidden by um, 
by the uh, rules of settlement of Anaris to even allow anybody from Arasti, once the settlement period was over, to, to come to Anaris. And they do have um, a bit of of contact through a uh, trade that periodically a freighter comes from a rusty and gets minerals and things like that uh, but really there's no contact between the two peoples so Shevik um, is a is is like I said lives on an Aris and he is an act actually a really a brilliant um, a, you know theoretical physicist and so he is working on some um, you know some some deep problems of he, I think he works in like temporal physics, you know, time. And um, so he gets a little bit of information, gets exchanged on these freighters between the scientific world on Arasti and the scientific world on Anaris. And um, so he feels like he's really walled off. He's, he's um, not able to get the information that he needs um, on his own planet that he feels like in some ways the um, societies on Arasti are... Uh, you know, further along. So he um, he is um, very frustrated by these walls. And, you know, walls are a continuing sort of symbol and theme throughout the entire book because walls have, um, to the people, there's a wall where the freighters land on Anaris periodically. There is a wall. It's a very small wall uh, but that you could actually easily climb over, but it's a symbolic wall that the people of Anaris will not cross because they don't want to contaminate their society um, with contact with Arasti. Um, and um, so the, the people on Arasti see this as um, walling them in as prisoners, that they're prisoners there. But of course, by the perspective of the people on Anaris, that's actually quarantining them. It's protecting them from, you know, a, a sort of diseased societies, the diseased societies that are on Arasti. So Shevik, um, winds up um he there's actually a quote um about walls it's actually in the book it says those who build walls are their own prisoners i'm going to go fulfill my proper function in the social organism i'm going to go unbuild walls that quote is from shevik um and um he ultimately does go to arasti um the um the people of anaris most of them actually do not want him to go, um, but because Aras, uh, Anaris is an anarchic system where anyone can is free to be themselves in whatever form that takes, then um, they can't truly stop him. Um, but um, you know, so the he he ends up going um, with the hopes of um, taking this technology of there's a there's a chance with the research he's been doing that there will be a a big breakthrough in technology and he wants to share it among all the nine known worlds um, so that everybody has it um, because he feels like his own planet Anaris would not even welcome it at all or it would never be put to use because they are very isolationist. So um, you know the the cool thing about this wall building thing though is that we get to see we get to, we get to see the different walls that are built within an RS, you know, so this utopian system, um, we get to see its flaws because, um, there's certain, um, there's certain, when, when, there's certain struck walls that get built even on an RS, even though there's no laws and no government just because of the social organism that humans are. And these are humans, by the way. Um, all the nine worlds are diff are humans that have been, um, uh, colonized by, um, by the Hanes, which is, I mentioned earlier, this is the Hainish cycle. Um, and actually the Terrans are, are present too, um, and they are, they are one of the nine worlds, um, but we do get to meet a few of them, but um, the story doesn't focus on them all that much. But anyway, um, back to the story. Um, so this is really cool. How we see the flaws then of of the anarchic system. Then he goes to Arasti, and we see that planet is one that we we more or less would recognize as sort of like ours because there's multiple. There's 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 a the main society that he he actually um, um, visits um, is is very capitalistic. So it's it's very uh, and very unequal. Um, there's a very unequal. Um, economic system. Everything is about property and economics. Um, women have a subjugated place in that society. Um, there's great inequality among people. Um, 
and a lot of exploit, obviously labor exploitation, um, and things like that. Um, and so whenever he goes there, he's actually, you know, shocked and appalled, uh, by what he, he finds, although he, he was aware of it to some degree. Um, but, um, you know, it's, the story takes place, tells us his experience there on a Rasti doing in their society. And then, um, each, uh, each chapter, one chapter is on an Anaris and one chapter, one chapter is on Anaris, uh, in his life before he went to Arasti. And then, um, the uh, the other chapters are when he's actually on Urasti. So um, we get to see his, you know, we have the central character and we get to see him interacting with both of these planets and both of these social structures. So that's really the kind of the cool thing about it. So, you know, um, my thoughts on it, I love this idea of anarchy. I loved exploring that idea, like what would it be like to live in a society that didn't have laws, that is entirely egalitarian, um, one cool thing about um, one cool thing about the Anarans when they moved there, they actually remade their language. They invented a new language for themselves that took out ownership. Um, you know, when you think about language, um, um, you you think about our, our language, English. Um, you know, has lots of uh, lots of designations for who owns what. Like, um, you know, my, we might say something like "my mother said." They wouldn't say that. They would say "the mother said." Um, so they have a very egalitarian society that women are, are equal. Um, work is actually, um, the word for work in their language and play is similar because Odo, who is the philosopher, you know, uh, or the, the, the thinker who actually led this revolution, um, you know, her writings are, are kind of the guidepost that they use to structure their society. And she understood in her writings that, or she makes it clear in her writings that she understood the, um, the danger of like having the word work associ associated with some sort of moralism where people would then think I'm working harder so therefore I'm better. So the whole language and the whole society is structured that no one ever thinks that they're better than anyone else. Everyone's free to do the work that they want to do. They can form the societies that they want to do for research. Um, you know, they're, they're really just free to move around. So I thought that was an awesome, uh, you know, idea to explore as I, before I close though, I want to just read one, one, one quote from the book. This is actually from, um, the prison letters of Odo. So, uh, it's one of these doc founding documents that the people of Anaris uses. Um, and this is a quote from, from Odo, you know, the, the revolutionary, it says, um, for each of us deserve everything, every luxury that was ever piled in the tombs of the dead kings. And we each of us deserve nothing, not a mouthful of bread and hunger. Have, have we not eaten while another starved? Will you punish us for that? Will you reward us for the virtue of starving while others ate? No man earns punishment. No man earns reward. Free your mind of the idea of deserving, the idea of earning, and you will begin to be able to think. So this book um, had a lot to think about. Uh, it was it was a great read, and um, you know provided a lot of a lot of brain food. It was great to go to this world and explore this way of living, uh, and think about what it would be like uh, to live in a world like that. So I'm going to close with that. Um, I will have. Um, I will have some other stuff coming up pretty soon, end of year wrap-ups, and next book I read, I'm still through the month of December, hope to get through several more rereads, so those will be coming. Stay tuned. Thanks. Bye.